Welcome Center after service so that we can get to know you a little bit better. We are in the middle of a sermon series called Arrows, and we're taking a look at what it means to live life on target for Christianity. What kind of a life does God want us to live? How should we conduct ourselves? How should we behave? If we are really claiming to be a follower of Jesus, what exactly does that look like? And if you remember from two, two weeks ago, we talked about this. A mark of Christian maturity, what it looks like to live a life as a Christian, is to stand firm in the face of persecution. Persecution is promised to us in this life. If we are followers of Jesus, it's going to happen. And so if we are really going to be who we claim to be, we will stand firm in the face of persecution. Last week, we talked about this, another mark of Christianity, another target, is standing firm against disunity in the church. Look, inner struggles happen. People disagree. People do things that are wrong. But yet, if we are really going to stand firm in the face of persecution, we have to do that together. And so we took a look at Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, where Paul says, look, I don't want you to do anything out of selfish ambition. I want you to strive for unity together. I want you to do life together. And yes, it's going to cost you. It's going to cost you a lot. But that's a mark of of the target of Christian living. Today, we're going to look at Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 5. You know, as I thought about this message, I couldn't help but identify and recognize in my own self that from the very beginning of my life and our lives, we are so egocentric. I mean, life is certainly about us. When we're born as a child, the first thing we do is we cry out for for mom or dad, and they come and they feed us and they take care of us because it's about making our needs. Not that we're consciously aware as a child, but you know what I mean. It's instinct. As a toddler, my son, the reason why he's so rotten and obnoxious like he is, he's great, we love him so much, but he is rotten to the core, is because he wants me to play with him. And so he wants what's best for him. He's a child. He's immature. He's just a young little boy. It's understandable. And I love it. And so he'll go over and do something or tease me and play and laugh and giggle because he craves dad's attention. So I'll get on the floor and play with him. Um, Or when we're teenagers, I could not stand it. My parents parented me different than my older sister. I wanted to do things that she was able to do. I wanted to have things that she was able to have. I wanted to claim the rights as a younger brother to my older sister because we're interested in what's for us. As an adult, do we not want the best job, the highest paying position? I mean, we want what what works for us. We want the right home that meets our needs. We want the right church that meets our needs. I mean, we are so heavily influenced in a consumer culture that life is certainly all about us. But here comes Paul challenging us with the gospel to resist that interest, to resist that instinct that, yes, we are born with this idea and with this nature that life is all about us, but Paul drops this bomb in Philippians chapter 2 where he says, life is not all about you. I want you to live like Jesus and look out for the interests of others, and he's going to show us how to do that. You see, becoming a Christian and looking at the example of Jesus, it really shows us that life is the exact opposite of what we think and how we feel. And so Paul says in verse 5 of Philippians chapter 2, he says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, and in heaven and on earth and under earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You know, there's a question I'm anticipating my kids asking as they get older. When I try to model and teach for them this life of self-denial, this life of self-sacrifice, this life of, if you remember last week, it's not that we're to neglect our interests, but we're also to look at the, out for the interests of others, not at a cost to other people and seeking out our own interests. And I know my kids one day are going to ask me this question, why? Why should I do that? Why shouldn't I carry, uh, be interested in carrying out my life for number one and being interested for me and doing things for me and taking care of me time? Why should I try to model 
this kind of life. And you know what? I think Paul was probably anticipating that same kind of question for those at Philippi. Why should we do this, Paul? And so Paul says, look, I'm going to strengthen my argument by me calling you to live a life of self-sacrifice. I'm going to strengthen my argument by giving you the greatest example that I could possibly ever give you. I'm going to share with you the example of Christ. And then that's just what we just read. Why should we do this? Because this is what Jesus did. And so in advancing this argument, he says in verse 5, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. You see, if our minds direct our behavior, and we want to be the Lord's people, and we want to exhibit Christ-like behavior, we've got to start with our mind. We've got to start with our attitude. How we not just perceive the world around us with a divine perspective, but how we react to the world around us. How did Jesus react? What did he do? That's what Paul is going to teach us about this morning. And what I like about verse 5, have this attitude, and the Greek is in the present imperative. It literally means keep thinking this. You know, if you've been a Christian for any period of time, you will know that Christianity is a life of ups and downs. You're strong and you're weak. You do well, and then you mess up and make mistakes. But the goal is as you mess up and as you heal and as you move forward is for you to continue to to climb the hill of maturity to becoming more like Christ. And remember from last week, just because you've been in the church the longest doesn't mean you're the most mature. Maturity is marked out by the pattern of behavior that we find here in the New Testament. And so Paul says, I want you to keep thinking this. I want you to have this attitude. Keep thinking this attitude. And then he says, in you yourselves. Now, some scholars believe he was talking to a group. This is what I want the group to do. But I think other scholars believe, in which I agree with, he's literally saying this. Each single person in the congregation has their own personal responsibility to have a Christ-like attitude. Have you ever told someone, you're making me angry? Have you ever told somebody that? I have. Have you ever put your emotions and your behavior off on the actions of someone else? Your reaction is really their fault. Well, Paul is basically saying this, your attitude is your responsibility. How you choose to view the world around you and react to that world is ultimately up to you. And you yourselves should keep thinking this, the same thing that Jesus thought. And so there are three key words that I'm going to focus in on this morning. And here's the first one. What kind of example did Jesus set for us? The first one is this, selfless. Jesus was selfless. Look what he said again in verse 6. Though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. What does this phrase mean, though he was in the, in the form of God? What is Paul talking about? Paul was talking about Christ and his pre-Christ form. There's a lot of different theology out there about the nature and the personhood of Jesus, but the Bible is absolutely clear that God, who was born of a woman, has always existed. Jesus did not become God in the flesh, nor did he give up God in the flesh. He didn't empty himself of his own deity. Instead, the Bible teaches that he took on the form of a servant. He added on his human nature. He didn't give up his divine nature. This word form in classical Greek, it's used as morphe. It literally means to change into a different form while keeping the inner essence as the same thing. When Jesus In his pre-existent state, when it says he was in the form of God, it means this. Everything that God was or is or shall be, that's what Jesus was, is, and shall be. Jesus is God. That's what the Bible affirms. You know, it's like this. We all have a human nature. Every single person in this room is endowed with a human nature. You are unique. You're distinct from the animal kingdom. You are a person. And despite your outer form changing... Your inner form remains the same. You will always be a person. Personhood is given to you by the Father of Spirits, Hebrews chapter 12 says. God becomes your father the moment that you're conceived in the womb. And so you're given personhood as an infant, you're still a person. As a teenager, you're still a person. As an adult, you're still a person. And then as an aged, I like to refer to age as like levels. You know, you've reached level 99. It's a lot better than saying you're 99 years old. It's level 99. It's a higher level. But even in your old age, you're still a, I know, it's so stupid. You're still a person. 
And so Jesus, despite having the human nature added on to his divine nature and personhood, he is still God in the flesh. It's like this. If you look up at the sun and you see the clouds come over the sun, you still have the sun that's in existence. It's just covered up by the clouds. Or think about an iceberg. Have you ever heard the phrase, the tip of the iceberg? Well, the water has covered the bottom of the iceberg, but that doesn't mean the bottom of the iceberg no longer exists. When Jesus took on the human nature, when he became a human person, when he became the Christ, uh, he was always the Son of God, it didn't take away from his deity. He added on human nature and human personhood. And so though he was in the form of God, the Bible says, Christ had the very nature of God. You know, John 1.1 1, 1 is probably one of the most famous passages of Scripture. It says this, In the beginning was the Word, speaking of Jesus. The Word was God. The Word was with God. He was in the beginning with God. And then in verse 14 it says, And the Word became flesh. And so here we have God, the eternal God, taking on human nature, being born of a virgin Mary. Why would he do that? What kind of attitude did he have? Well, look what it says in verse 6. He did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped. God in his eternal state, his pre-Christ state, thought himself of this way. I am a selfless, sacrificial person. God, who has every right to have everything he ever should have, didn't think of himself that way. You know, when we look at presidents and kings, politicians, or people in powerful positions— You know a lot about them by how they view their position. Are they there to serve the will of the people and for the people and by the people? Or is it for their own power, their own prestige, their own wealth? Why is God the way that he is? Well, this is what it says about Jesus. This idea of equality with God, it describes, like I said, his pre-incarnate existence. He existed in the manner of God, whatever God was, that's what Jesus was. And he says he didn't think of himself as godhood or divinity as something to be grasped. This is the only time it's ever used in the Bible. In classical Greek literature, it's used of robbery or even rape. It means to seize and take advantage of a person or a situation. And here's what it means. Jesus did not view his divinity as something that he should take advantage of when he became a human. I mean, after all, if we look at the example of Christ, you might be tempted to think, yeah, but he was God. I mean, come on. How hard is it to resist sin and temptation when you're God? And Paul wanted to make it absolutely clear that the life that Jesus lived, this life of selflessness and sacrificialness and love and care, he didn't use his deity in any way, shape, or form. He didn't take advantage of that. But look what it says. Instead, he emptied himself. Well, we know he didn't empty himself of his deity. What does it mean that he emptied himself? I like how Paul put it in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. He says, Jesus Christ, though he was rich, for your sake became poor. He had the rank. He had the right. He had the prerogative. He had the position. And he gave it up. He literally gave up a palace to live in a ghetto. He gave up a single family home to live in a cardboard box. He gave up everything that he was entitled to for the sake of us. You want to talk about what it means to be a selfless person. We find this example of who Jesus was. You know, when we look at this passage, it teaches us that Christ was utterly selfless, selfless, but also he was a man of service. That's the second key word that I'd like to focus in on with verse 7. Christ served others. It says in verse 7, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. See, rather than taking away from his divinity, He added to it human likeness. He took the form, the only time that it's used in reference to Jesus, of a servant. You know, the human nature and the divine nature, they don't contradict one another. That's what we find out in this passage. They complement one another. We can see that Paul says, look, divinity and servanthood is not contradictory to human likeness. God is here to serve. That's exactly what he did. We think that God wants our service, and he absolutely does. But God is the first actor. God came to serve us. You know, the Greco-Roman society, what they believed about, uh, about being a slave is that you were void of all your basic human rights. Um, you didn't own anything. You, didn't, you weren't entitled to anything. And that's what God says about himself. I'm not going to be entitled. I'm going to serve. I'm going to be selfless. I'm here for you. 
That's the example that Paul is setting up for us. God himself is selfless. God himself is a person of service. What kind of people should we be is the question that Paul asks. I love what Mark said about Jesus. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so if I have a key point, this is the key, 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 key point of the passage. This is the focal point. Paul is illustrating this. Christ stooped down low. He gave up everything to look out for the interest of others rather than his own interest. And if Paul said that's what Christ did, that's what we should do. He stooped low. That's the kind of life that we're called to live. That doesn't mean you've got to go out and sell your house and give up your job and take on monasticism. We talked about that last week. Monasticism is false. It's based on a bad theology that you need to retreat and beat yourself and devoid yourself of all of life's pleasures. That's not what Paul's talking about at all. Ultimately, Paul gives us this example. Christ was not only selfless, he not only served, but he was humble. That's the third key word. He was humble. How did Christ humble himself? It says in verse 8, he became a man, and as a man, he was even obedient to the point of death, and not just death, but death on a cross. You know, we wear crosses, we put crosses on our body, we have crosses in our auditorium, but I think our culture maybe has lost a little bit of the significance of what a cross meant back in this ancient time. Crucifixion was invented by the Persians, it was perfected by the Greeks, it was, or perfected by the Romans. It was the most horrific way a person could possibly die. There was no more humiliating position than hanging on a cross naked with your main uh, nerve crushed in both arms and your legs, sending up shooting pain as you cried out, cried out naked on a cross. And you fought for every inch of the remaining life that you had as you tried to prevent yourself from dying from suffocation. You would be bleeding. You would be humiliated. People would come by and mock you and make fun of you as you died a very slow and painful death. The God of the entire universe gave up his right, took on the human nature, died not just a normal death, but on a cross for us. That is the example that Paul says we should live. Amen. That's what it means to be selfless. That's what it means to be serving. That's what it means to be humble, to stoop down low, to look out for the interest of other people. It's the lowest a person could go, and Christ went there. And so my question to you is this, is how low are you willing to go to help out other people? How low are you willing to go to serve other people in our community, in our church? Do you think teaching children is above you? Do you think signing up for Winter Relief, which is our uh, homeless week, where we welcome homeless people into our church, and they sleep, and they eat, and they shower here, and um, people that have just had a very difficult time in life, and we want to serve them as serving homeless people beneath you? What about people who struggle with prostitution or sexually immoral? Is it beneath you to associate yourselves with them, to love them, and to care for them? Is it beneath your social status to associate with people that are poor and don't have a lot of money? Is it beneath you to associate with somebody that doesn't have the same skin color as you or maybe doesn't agree with your political affiliation? How low, Paul says, are you willing to go to love other people, to serve other people, to speak truth into the lives of other people? Well, let me give you an example, Paul says. Look at Jesus. What's the point? What is Paul trying to accomplish here? He's trying to transform their mind and how they think, not just about themselves, but other people, so that he can transform how they treat other people. That's the goal. That's the hope of Paul. Why does Paul want to transform their attitude? Why does Paul want to transform their action? Because if they remain faithful in the face of persecution, if they stand up strong against disunity in the church, if they're willing to look out for the interests of others, Paul says there is a glory that is to be revealed that you will attain. It's this es eschatological hope. That's a big word, isn't it? Eschatology, it's the study of end times. Paul is looking out at the future where we all will be one day. And he says, if you are selfless, 
If you serve, if you are humble, if you stand strong for the truth, you will obtain a future glory. That's the whole point. That's why we're here. Because this life that we live is just a little narrow point on a very long line. And Paul says, that's what I'm working towards. And that's what I want you to work towards. There is more than just this life. And that's why he says in Philippians 2, 9, Therefore, because Christ lived this way, God exalted him highly and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Nobody stooped as low as Jesus, and he regained his rank that he had before the world ever began. Christ received his glory after his crucifixion, And after his resurrection, what kind of glory are you going to receive? Well, I can tell you what kind of glory you're going to receive by asking you the question, what kind of life are you living? Is it one that's selfless? Is it one that's focused on service? Is it one that's focused on humility? Because if we live that kind of life, Paul says, if we follow the example of Christ, we will view him as he is and we will become like him in glory. You know, I wish I could fully describe exactly who Jesus is in an adequate terms, but I don't know if you ever heard this um, older gospel preacher by the name of S.M. Lockridge. He was a fiery preacher, and in an hour-long sermon, he tries to describe exactly who Christ is in his glory, and I think he did it a lot better way than I could do it. And so I've got a video that I want to show you so you can adequately understand exactly who Christ is in his glory. Let's go ahead and show it. is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I wonder do you know him. My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's in Highly sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's un. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captive. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent and he purifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's a key to knowledge. He's a well-trained of wisdom. He's a doorway of deliverance. He's a pathway of peace. He's a roadway of righteousness. He's a highway of holiness. He's a gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign and his yoke is easy, and his firm is right. I wish I could describe him, for yet he's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. Well, you can't get him out of your mind. You can't, you can't get him off of your head. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found 
found out they couldn't stop him. Tyler couldn't find any fault in him. Terror couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. And the brain Gives me chills, man. Gets me fired up. Guys in high school would always be like, dude, you're weird, man. Why are you listening to this kind of stuff before football games? And it just, I don't know, it just got me excited. You know what I mean? But, uh, but I mean, it, it's, that's who Jesus is. And one of the best questions in the video is, do you know him? You see, a lot of people know of Jesus. Yeah, I know him. I just don't know him personally. And we need a personal relationship with Christ. He is the one true God. He was revealed in the Christian scriptures. He was authorized and vindicated through his resurrection. He is who he claimed to be. And somebody like Paul was willing to give up, as we'll see in a few weeks, everything that was of benefit and value to him. What would cause a guy like Paul, a zealous Jew with money, power, influence, prestige, zealous for Judaism, hated the church, what would cause a guy like Paul to give up everything, to be beaten and ultimately beheaded in Rome? What would cause that? Well, it was Jesus. It was Jesus. And so I'd like to end with a few things that we could do ourselves to hit the target of Christian living. There are three things that we can do. Here's the first one. Paul told us last week in Philippians 2, 1 through 4, that we shouldn't be selfish or conceited, but we should look out for the interests of others. That's what Jesus did. That's what we should do. 1 John chapter 3, verse 16 puts it like this. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. And so if Jesus lived a selfless life, we should too. We should be willing to sacrifice, even if it ultimately comes to our life, for each other. If Christ lived a life, an example of service, we too should serve. We should not only look out for the interests of other people, but when opportunities present themselves, as we saw last week, be helpful. Winter relief is coming up in March. It's something we should all find a way to give. Look, I get it. Sometimes you don't have the vacation to sacrifice, to come and stay with people overnight, but maybe you could help financially. Sometimes you maybe not be able to stay overnight, but maybe you could come and clean the bathrooms once a day because they use them. I mean, everybody in this room should find a way to give and look out for the interests of other people in our community. Student ministry. Our students are being raised in one of the most highly toxic cultural uh, environments ever to be known. It's not that necessarily principles and things have changed. It's that it's in their face 24-7 with technology. We need to love them, encourage them, appreciate them, Lead them, set a motto, an example for them to follow. How can we help look out for the interests of our students? Well, what about Hope for All? One of the greatest local organizations in our community. They help families, they sacrifice, they serve. It's a nonprofit organization that we support. They will give furniture and clothing and materials to people right here in our own backyard. But those materials just don't magically pop into existence on the shelf. Clothes have to be sorted. Things have to be folded. I mean, they do so much work, and they rely on people like us. They need help. How can we look out for the interests of other people? Easter Sunday's coming up. We're going to have an Easter team, and we're going to set up a photo booth and love families that come into this church for the very first time, the very first sermon they have heard either in a long time or even for their first time. And it's all going to be about this Sunday experience that they, uh, you know, they're C&E, Christmas and Easter. And they're going to come and they're going to hear the gospel. And we can love them and encourage them. Do you want to be a part of an Easter team? I mean, there are so many ways that we can be selfless and we can serve. Paul put it like this to the church uh, at Galatia. He says, for you are called to free- freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. And then finally, if Christ's life was an example for us to follow in humility. We too should be humble. And so what small sacrifices are you willing to make so that we can be in harmony with each other? That's what Paul's asking. What sacrifices can you make so that we can be in harmony with one another? And so that's my challenge to you. What sacrifice can you make 
And in order to keep us in harmony, everybody on the same page, everybody getting along, moving forward with the right goal and the right mindset, with the right attitude and the right view of life, what can we do and what can we sacrifice to help other people? Peter put it like this in 1 Peter 5, 5, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility towards one another, for God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. That's the life that God is calling us to live. That's the life that he wants us to attain. Paul gave them this example so that they could be transformed in how they think and in how they act. Let us follow.